Welcome to Multiple Offers, a real estate show with competing perspectives. Today we are talking with the mayor. Put that coffee down. If you're good at something, never do it for free. How'd you get the gig? Oh, you know, they were hiring. It was only a two-week course. I will sell this house today. What are you, some kind of real estate agent? Oh, he's a realtor. There is a difference somehow. This is Multiple Offers, a real estate show. All right, guys, it is episode 24. And uh, today we've got a little bit of a different format. We're not going to be going through all of the uh, usual real estate talk because uh, we have Mayor Jonathan Cote from New West with us today. Um, before we get into all of that, though, uh, how are you guys doing? What's going on? I'm good. I had uh, a great Thanksgiving weekend. Oh, yeah, it was Thanksgiving. Yeah, it was and fantastic. Actually, like some good solid time off. <laughs> I cooked for fun again, which was good. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I ate my first tofurkey. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> I don't know if they're supposed to be awful, but it was completely, yeah, it was awful. Yeah, that's pretty good. I had a pretty w- a whirlwind long weekend. Yeah. I was back and forth from Edmonton for a w- cousin's wedding, and then I did two turkey dinners at home. Back to back. Yeah, so I did a wedding. I was in Edmonton Friday, Saturday night, turkey dinner Sunday night, turkey dinner Monday night, so I had a pretty good weekend. Wow. <laughs> What's for lunch? <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of leftovers. A lot of turkey sandwiches. Huh. <laughs> and I didn't have to cook any of it. It was a really good four days. I, um, uh, uh, my wife is uh, out, of, out of town right now, so it's just me and my son. And uh, so I'm trying to do solo dad, uh, which is a lot. I'm glad she took our daughter with us <laughs> um, or with her. I, I was actually, Jonathan, telling my son that you were coming today, and I thought he'd be all excited. I was like, hey, Asher, the, the mayor's coming to our house uh, today. And uh, he said, tell him not to come. <laughs> um, and this, uh, he watches a lot of Paw Patrol, and, and there's a bad guy mayor. Oh. On Paw Patrol, <laughs> so I'm I'm pretty sure that was the association, because um, he said not to bring his cats, um, which is what the bad guy here on Paw Patrol <laughs> has as well. Um, and uh, I guess we shouldn't stall any longer. So we have we have Jonathan Cote on the show. Uh, Jonathan is the mayor of New Westminster. He has been for the last four years. Before that, he was a city councillor for nine years. He has his master's in urban planning, and he lives in downtown New West with his wife and three daughters. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Welcome. Hey, okay, thanks for having me. How's your day going? Oh, it's doing pretty good. The sun is shining, so can't uh, good campaigning weather, that's for sure. That is very true. You haven't had too many terrible mornings out there. You know, a few weeks ago got to got a little bit wet, but I uh, can't complain. The last the last week has been been beautiful. Great for for getting out in the doors and uh, all the stuff you do. In the Sorry, and, and you educated us uh, big time getting our learn on before we started recording. What is it called? Oh yeah, we when learned you, a new word. When you wave at cars in the yeah, morning. So it's called uh, called Burma shaving. Uh, so that's uh, it. Actually, comes from the uh, the Burma shave the shaving company. Um, that's how they used to advertise. They. Uh, Innovated, I think, back in the 1950s, uh, standing out at traffic, waving <laughs> with signs. And, and you know, most companies don't do that anymore, but politicians can't get enough of it. So, uh. where, where does Burma shaving rank on the effectiveness for campaigning scale? You know, it's it's probably not at the at the top of the list, but uh, you know, I think with any campaign, you want to have as many touch points with people as possible. And uh, you know, I think it's most people aren't going to decide to vote for someone based on Burma <laughs> shaving. That guy sh- shook his sign at me. <laughs> Having said that, I think when you start to see some names uh, kind of kind of reappear uh, time and time again, it can have an effect. Uh, I do have uh, a, you know a bit of a confession to make. Uh, the first time I voted, I was 19 years of age. Uh, it was a municipal election. Didn't. Really really know many of the characters and wasn't sure who to vote for mayor but at the time I voted for uh, for, for a guy because I saw him standing out in the pouring rain waving uh-huh. at traffic and uh, you never know sometimes the strangest things can be uh, can lead to lead to a vote a, vo- a vote is a vote exactly <laughs> it, it's weird too because I've, I've been in my townhouse for um, just over a year and this is the first time I was in a condo before that I've had people knocking on my doors and before a few months ago I would have said, Oh, door knocking doesn't make any sense to me. Why am I going to change how I feel about somebody knocking on my door? Uh, you knocked on my door. I've had a couple other people knock on my door. And it, it does change. When you can spend a few minutes with somebody talking to them, 
it totally changed. All of a sudden, you're a real person. It, it, it's shocking how and you're, effective you're it a, is. You're a diehard door knocker, right? Uh, like I, you, I'm a diehard. You've knocked, you knocked every door in the U.S. Like I'm, how many times? Not, not in say? every election, uh, you know, every a single election, but uh, but over time, I probably do between three and five thousand doors every every campaign that, that I do. And wow. to me, I I would put that at, at the top of the list because it gives people an opportunity to to kind of get to meet you, get to know a little bit about yourself. But it's also hmm. a great opportunity for the candidate to kind of learn you know, on the street, what people are thinking about, what issues are, are important. And, you know, particularly as an incumbent mayor, that's that's really important. Yeah, well, and I, I'd like to think that this show is kind of like knocking on a few extra doors for the people who listen. It's a pretty detailed conversation. And I got that individual benefit from our episode uh, 21, where we had the incumbent council candidates on, um, who are all members of Team Cote, and uh, learned a bit more from them. And I, I definitely learned a few things, and, and maybe they changed some of my opinions about them or the way that they contribute on council. So having a long-form discussion, if it's at someone's door in this recording, I think is is very valuable yeah for sure matt do you want to take us through through this actually we have a bumper to play before we go through the main we're, structure we're, we're going we just in, get into we're, it we're going in all right let's dive in i'm ready now you want to get nuts come on let's get nuts you decide your own level of involvement well i guess this is a case where we'll have to agree to disagree i don't agree to that Neither do I. Wrong. National debt. Wrong. You're an advocate. Wrong. Wrong. Without money, you lost wrong. 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 Very nice words, but happens to be wrong. You're listening to Multiple Offers, a real estate show. Okay, so I am going to start with uh, just introducing the framework of how this episode is going to go for our listeners because it is a long format conversation and we'll put in the show notes too to help you jump around to different segments if you just want to hear about one thing or another. We're going to start by speaking to uh, homeowners and a lot of that is around development in New West and how that impacts homeowners and it might be for a buyer as well, somebody who wants to buy in New West as, as a purchaser. And then we'll talk about infrastructure related to all of our housing development. A lot of people have... Um, vocalize some concerns around keeping up with our infrastructure with all of the density that we're adding. And then third, we're going to speak to renters and what the city is doing to help with renters who are being uh, effective in a variety of different ways as the cost of living increases. So we'll be getting into that. Uh, Jeremy is going to start by asking some of our first questions, but I have the very first question that I want to ask. And we talked about this yesterday and I just, uh, Mayor Cote, I'm wondering if you can just pronounce this word on my notepad. Uh, (laughs) Kikite. Right? Oh, you did it. I thought we were joking about that. <laughs> I actually do need some community consensus on it. <laughs> we asked the real hardball questions here on get, get multiple out of the way of the <laughs> Is that where your kids go to school? It is. Yeah, do, yes. yeah, yeah. So you have to hear that at least twice a year, maybe. Yeah. Looks like a great school. It is a great nice school. Nice and close to home. Okay. But before we get into the meat of it, um, I just wanted to ask you, so... Way back in the day when you originally ran for city council, uh, how did you first get involved in politics? Why why did you decide to run originally? Yeah, well, you know, I think we can go back to to probably when I was, was in high school. Uh, you know, as many people playing with a variety of video games, uh, the game of choice for me was, was SimCity. Uh, the, the hours oh. I, I spent in... You know, my uh, preteen years playing SimCity, mm. uh, you know, I think definitely... Uh, Started a, started an interest in uh, in, in cities. Uh, you know, I think getting into university. You know, my two big interests uh, were were urban planning and political science. And you mix political science and urban planning <laughs> together, <laughs> and I guess you end up with a mayor. <laughs> huh? I spent most sense. of my time in Sim City, bringing the aliens down <laughs> and smashing the city. That see, no, yeah, no, no. I, <laughs> You know, I, I spent my formative years building some of the most incredible cities, uh, you know, ever, ever seen. And unfortunately, they're all uh, saved on some floppy disk somewhere. Oh, so, no. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, you know, some inquiring minds out there seen you sort of walking around town. I know you, you like to commute by foot if you can. Um, and sometimes you're seen with headphones in. Are you listening to, to music? podcast what's what's going on in the headphones yeah it 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 can be a variety of things but it is mainly mainly music uh, to kind of get me get me pumped up for wherever i'm going or get me in the right uh, right frame of mind so uh, some walking music I've, I've got my spotify playlist that uh, you know i've got i got going on there so and Most you want to elaborate on that playlist at all for some of your walking music and eat? Well, if, if anyone wants to follow the mayor's playlist it's open on spotify <laughs> oh is it really <laughs> yes, uh, all right <laughs> nice be, be checking that one out i'm not a spotify user i might have to sign up <laughs> Another question we probably should get into um, 
because I mean, like Matt said earlier, we learned a lot from some of the incumbents things that, you know, you We've got a, a, a decent understanding of some of the ins and outs and things and definitely have a better understanding now after having them on the show. Um, you were a councillor before and now you are, you're, you're the mayor. What are some of the differences between, between those two jobs? Yeah, well, uh, you know, definitely there are, are some differences, but there's, there's a lot of similarities in terms of kind of the, the roles and, and, and responsibilities. Uh, you know, the big difference is, is the time commitment. Uh, you know, I, I think a city councillor is still very much a, a part-time role uh, here in, 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 in the city of New Westminster, a city of our size, uh, but uh, definitely the role of mayor is, is a full-time role. I'm at City Hall five, six days, days a week there. Uh, you know, I think uh, first starting off with, with your regular council meetings, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to be a member of sitting around the table, but actually chairing the meeting and directing the agenda and getting through to, uh, to the results is uh, certainly a different, different role there. Uh, you know, I remember being a city councillor and it was, you know, actually you just show up to, to council meetings and you just voice your opinions, you have your say and you're done. <laughs> but no, the mayor actually actually has to sometimes step back with their own thoughts and actually manage what, is, what are the voices of all the different voices around the table and try and figure out where is the, where is the consensus, what is the, what is the decision that's coming out of this, this larger discussion. So it's it definitely is a different approach from there, uh, and then you know the other days a week, uh, you know, uh, you know the mayor has a has a big role to actually work with with senior staff to to implement the direction of, of council. So uh, often I spend the days after a council meeting meeting with senior staff, uh, kind of working on how how do we implement the decisions that were made on on, on a council Monday. Uh, also, the mayor is is generally the face face of the city. So mm-hmm. whether it's a, a community event or a media, you know, inquiry, uh, you know, nine times out of ten, it's the it's the the mayor. So I, you know, I often say if if you're not a fan of public speaking, uh, this probably is not the not the role for you. <laughs> Absolutely, I, I thought that was interesting. There, you talked about council meeting where, as as you're the chair, would you say that at times you act as as the mediator? Almost. Yeah, you know, I think a, a bit of a mediation facilitator, uh, you know, and, and I think everyone has their, their own style, but, uh, you know, definitely the style I've taken to, to the mayor's position. And, and I do voice my opinions on, on topics, and those opinions don't always uh, completely correlate with, mm. uh, with the people sitting around, uh, around the table. But it's always important to me that I don't start off every agenda item telling what I think, because sometimes that can actually prejudge a conversation. Uh, I take great pride in actually allowing council to have their first, you know, first opportunity to kind of voice their different opinions. After that's happened, then I can insert some of my thoughts and then figure out, well, then where's, where's the best way to go forward? What's the best way to, to bring basically a decision that, that really represents the, the, the broad conversation that's occurred? Okay, cool. And there's a ton of documents that are usually in the agenda for a meeting. You said council members can just kind of fly in and start talk, chatting. Do you feel like you have a greater responsibility to read through those those documents in detail before well, council I, you meetings? Well, you know, I, I'm a bit of a stickler that it's everyone's responsibility around the council table to to make sure you're coming to, to the meetings prepared and that you've, you've, you've read, read all the materials uh, because city staff spend hours putting together... They are. You thorough know, documents. You know, you know, sometimes it's 500 pages, sometimes it's, you know, even a lot, a lot more than that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of reading to do on a weekend, but, uh, you know, there's, you know, there'd be nothing worse than, than a council coming not prepared, actually having understood, because it's frustrating from a staff perspective, even, you know, if you were to get questions on something you've just written about in the report. So I, I think that's not only an obligation for the mayor, that's an obligation for every single person sitting around that table. Okay, cool. And, uh, as far as uh, council members, there are six. There are six. Yes. Six councillors. Is that normal? Some of our listeners aren't just in New West, right? So they're trying to understand their civic election, what to do. Is it normal to have an even number of councillors? So it's it's always an odd number. So we actually have seven on the council, the mayor and six councillors. So mm-hmm. you'll always will have an odd mm. odd okay, number. So is- the number of councillors is even. Then you add the, then mayor you add the mayor to make it the odd number. The odd number, yeah. Now, depending on the size of your city, will depend often depend on the size of your council. So Vancouver has ten city councilors and one mayor, but New Westminster, being a smaller city, only has six. Okay, and is my historical understanding correct that if out of the six councilors a decision is reached? you don't actually submit a vote? So that's actually completely inaccurate. And it's one of the, the great... Hang mis- on, wait. Fact Matt <laughs> got something... Yeah. What? Wrong. <laughs> oh. Very nice words, but happens to be wrong. I, I, <laughs> I, I know who gave me this piece of information, and I will not name that individual. And, and it's, it, but it's, it's, it's actually uh, you know, something that is, is believed quite widely out there, that the mayor's only role is to, to break the vote. But no, the mayor actually votes on every single item. 
And so often what happens though, when you're watching a meeting, the mayor calls the vote. The mayor's not sitting there putting their, putting their hand up, but unless the mayor indicates, it counts as a vote in the affirmative. Oh, so, interesting. But it's, it's important that every single vote is recorded for all members of council and, and the mayor, and the mayor does vote on every single single item. So uh, no, no easy way out on tough <laughs> issues for, for the mayor. Fully documented. That's exciting. I got hmm. burned. <laughs> what, Show's uh, over, guys. Sorry. That's out. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, what are the limitations of, of, mayor? When, when, of the mayor? When, when we, put out, we put out a bunch of questions for council and for you, um, and we got a lot of requests that I feel like were way outside the scope. So are, are there any things that you wish um, people could understand as far as the scope of your authority or what are, what are some common misconceptions about what a mayor can and can't accomplish? Yeah, well, you know, I think sometimes, and, and quite understandably, people lead busy lives, but kind of knowing the different responsibilities of the different levels of government, uh, you know, there are certain areas that local government's involved with, from, you know, your engineering streets uh, to, to planning to parks mm. and recreation uh, to police, but there's other levels of government like healthcare, education, that are completely out of, out of the mandate of, of local governments where we don't, don't have, have that discretion. Uh, there's also some areas, uh, you know, even within the, the local government, uh, you know, the first email I got as, as the mayor of New Westminster that came into my inbox was uh, a request to waive a parking ticket. And uh, that's actually not the responsibility of, of the mayor. And, and the mayor actually doesn't have the discretion to just waive parking tickets. Oh, that was going to be my next <laughs> so, question. <laughs> I, I will say that there is certainly some mythology that your predecessor was flexing that muscle around city council well, <laughs> or not council, I should say, but city hall. <laughs> so, you know, and, and you know, all I can do is speak for myself, but I think there, there's appropriate areas where the mayor play, plays a role, but, uh, but necessarily being the judge and jury on, on parking tickets, I don't, uh, don't think is one of them. So you don't pardon anyone. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> there's no pardoning power. <laughs> okay. So if you're flexing muscle around city hall, around the city of new Westminster, where do you as mayor have the biggest impact on what is the core topic of our, our show today, which is housing? Where do you think you can have the biggest impact? Well, you know, I think the, the biggest impact is, is around the council table because ultimately the, the broad level of vision and decisions from the city on a policy perspective is sitting around around that table. Now, no doubt the implementation of that policy is, is critically important and the mayor plays a very important role in taking whatever decisions and actions that happen around the council table and say working with development of, you know, the director of development services or the city's social planner or whomever the appropriate person would be to to actually see, see the policies come into being in place, monitor them and make sure that they're actually achieving the the objectives that they're they're supposed to be object, achieving uh, i think the mayor also plays a role in in the city being the representative of the city in the region so i serve on the metro vancouver board and i also serve on on the translink mayor's council so those are our two bodies that obviously have a big impact on you know regional housing policy and, and transportation policy there and i think there's there's opportunities when discussions get a a bit beyond your local level, and particularly when you have discussions where the region is trying to advocate the provincial government, it's often a lot more effective to advocate as Metro Vancouver than, say, advocate as uh, you know a smaller municipality in the region. What What are the biggest challenges working with the other cities? Well, you know what I think. Uh, I actually think the Metro Vancouver model, and, and most people don't know a lot about it, uh, actually works very well. Uh, you know, Metro Vancouver uh, as an organization takes care of a lot of you know things like providing you know the sewer service, water service, uh, those those types of utilities, regional regional planning, regional parks. And actually takes on services that uh, that actually would be very difficult or would be less cost effective if individual municipalities were were, were to take them on. Uh, you know, I think sometimes there's there's always a perception that municipalities are always always fighting each other, and you know, I think that's because you know that's the only time media coverage happens right. when when cities are disputing. <laughs> But the vast majority of time, uh, you know, Metro Vancouver actually has a really strong history of municipalities working together. Uh, you know, a good example is, uh, is the regional growth strategy. Uh, you know, this is a strategy that started in the 1970s. And municipalities, for the most part, have done a very good job of actually following and sticking to a regional plan, even though individual municipalities, if they wanted to, could, could go off in their own direction. So, you know, I think, I think the, the region actually has a, a long history of, of municipalities working really well together. I got a question. So, which municipalities are represent have representation at the with, with Metro Vancouver? Yep. So it's uh, it's all twenty one of the the municipalities. Uh, there's the Tawasan First Nation group, and then there's oh, wow. Electoral Area A, which uh, includes UBC and some of the less defined areas of, of Metro Vancouver. So, hmm. 
Pectoral area A. I yeah. wonder why they got to be A. <laughs> you know, I think... We, <laughs> we've talked about on the show about how I have a property outside of Princeton. I'm in electoral area H. So apparently we fall way down the alphabet. <laughs> Do you want to move into OCP stuff, Matt? Yeah, that's a that's a really great introduction. I already have a better understanding and have been totally slayed on what the mayor can do at voting, so that's great. <laughs> Poor Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so let's 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 change the topic. No, let's talk about homeowners. And and when, it, when we talk about homeowners, we do talk about people considering purchasing in New West. So we we as realtors we represent sellers, we represent purchasers, and we find that that's where there's there's the biggest conversations around what can we do to help these people, to help the people who currently live here who want to be able to sell their home or maybe move if it's downsizers or people moving up the property ladder. There's a lot of different things going on. So the first overreaching sort of umbrella topic that all of this falls under typically is the OCP, the Official Community Plan, a long time in development. And uh, we learned in episode 21 that it's a document that is a living document, as I heard said a number of times, and can be revised. But there was an article in the summer uh, from the New West Record that suggested, should we be revisiting the OCP? Was it too little, too late? Do things need to change? So from your individual opinion, I mean, with the OCP and looking forward, what, is, what does this look like? What can maybe you tell the voters for your next term how the OCP can relate helping homeowners, people who want to purchase and live in New West or move out the property ladder. Yeah, well, you know, the official community plan is probably the most important planning document that mm-hmm. uh, that any city has because it, it really lays out the kind of the future vision and the land use designations, you know, for, for decades, decades to come. Uh, before the current OCP, which uh, just completed last year, uh, you know, it had been the late 90s since uh, the city of New Westminster had, had done its gone through an OCP process. And, you know, give a lot of credit to uh, to the folks that worked on that at that time because it was a really forward-thinking uh, document that served the city. Like the 90s one? The one in the 90s, yeah. yeah. That that served the city very well and kind of outlined a, you know, a pattern for how the, the city would, would, would evolve over that time. And, you know, I, I think it did a good job of, of actually being having the city be able to be prepared hmm. for the past 10 years where the city of New Westminster has actually seen some tremendous change and, and interest that wasn't necessarily there in the 90s, uh, 90s or 80s. Uh, so... You know, when I got elected, though, it was uh, definitely a top priority for myself to uh, uh, to kind of shake off the, the the OCP, which was getting a little bit uh, a little bit dated, and really spend some significant time with the community. And we spent three years working on uh, on the Fisher Community Plan. It was probably the largest public engagement process uh, uh, that the city's undertaken. Uh, now, when you take on a, a large public engagement process, uh, uh, the usual result is you're going to get many different voices, and, and many voices that aren't necessarily all all in complete uh, complete alignment and uh, you know I think we did a, a really wonderful job to to actually incorporate all of those different different voices and there were a few areas that you know I think some people wish we had pushed a little harder and some people on the other side wish thinks we have pushed pushed uh, too too hard but I think the the OCP uh, does a very good job of, of kind of designating you know our, our highest areas of, of, of growth uh, and density around the Skytrain stations which has mm-hmm. always been a long term uh, you know I think it opens up discussions about changing land use around the 22nd Street station which you know for the most part is a, is a land use that doesn't doesn't really correspond too well with with a rapid transit station uh, it also does a lot to open up new housing options so things like laneway housing has now been opened up in, in single family neighborhoods uh, and certain areas of our single family neighborhoods have been opened up for for townhouses and and triplexes and in those types of housing options because you know I think we definitely did hear through the process and and it's a larger trend in the region that you know our region needs more more housing options to to be available and and some were we're not in good supply in, in the city. So yeah, we'd like to speak more to that. That was a question when we asked our listeners for questions that that came up a lot. Well, and that, and that yeah comes up a lot just in dealing with our job. Yeah, townhouses specifically. Yeah. yeah, so townhouses and row houses, which are, are really missing as far as supply goes. So a couple of, of layers into that. So one is that we hear a ton of feedback that obviously there isn't enough supply, and the second is when we try to uh, help illustrate to people where those town that townhouse supply could be added. Most of what was approved is on the main arterial streets of New West, and you've you've spoken to that about the feedback from the community, and I think that was, in my opinion, watching the OCP consultation process, and I was involved throughout the years uh, of doing that, and I echoed my opinion, but 
was that there's a, certainly a segment of the population that really didn't want it on their streets off the main streets. So they were very, very vocal, and it was quite contentious. But then there's the people who do need a place to live and a way of transitioning from a condo to a house, or maybe never making it to a house, but at least keeping their family in New West. Um, I've gone on record as saying I think that council and mayor should have uh, been a little more firm on, on helping the city add that housing stock off the arterial streets. And uh, I'm taking a lot of your time here speaking, but it was, it was pretty important to me. It's pretty important to mark our clients. So with all that being said, I'll, I'll leave you open to comment or, uh, you know, call me out and, and prove me wrong again. <laughs> I, I think once is enough for, for a podcast, but, uh, you I, can call him <laughs> out as many times as you would like. I think Jared and I enjoy it. <laughs> you know what, uh, you know, I think what's called is the missing middle, and this isn't just a New Westminster issue. This is an issue for a lot of North American cities. Uh, uh, New Westminster has a really healthy supply of single-family neighborhoods. Uh, we actually also have a very healthy supply of, of, of apartment-style style units as well, too, but not as much in, in that middle. And the reason why that's so important is, you know, we want to be a city that accommodates people through all of their age, age demographics. And yeah. if you get to the point where you can live in the city in your 20s, but then when you start to have a family, you have to move out, well, then things start to to not be not be as cohesive. So one of the the goals through the OCP process was to say how can we start to open up some some more areas uh, that can can accommodate the missing middle townhouses and, and different land uses. And uh, you're right, there was definitely some push and pull in in, in the community. Uh, we did manage to get almost 10 percent of the single family neighborhoods in in New Westminster actually designated to, to, to see the potential for, for townhouses. Uh, I think you're definitely right in your comments that uh, the areas that were most accepting tended to be the, the main corridors, and that's that's pretty typical, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a first start. But it's not the only areas that, uh, that were designated through this official community plan process. There's actually, I would say, probably an equal level has been actually dug into into the neighborhoods. Um, for me, though, it's, you know, it's not an official community plan, though, unless the community can, can buy into it. And there were, you know, take Fifth Street as, as an example. Uh, you know, I think from a planning point of view, I think there's a lot of good reasons for that particular street to, to be designated for, for, for townhouses. Having said that, when every single resident on that street comes forward and says we do not want this designation or I right. think that's that's something that you can't just dismiss and, and, and ignore and the reality is are you really going to start to see the land use changes you want when you've got that level of animosity in a particular particular area so you know moving forward I think we've made some important good first steps in, in this official community plan um, but you know I think if there are other opportunities and we have left the door open through you know I think in two, after two years of the OCP uh, we've left it open that we're going to continue to review the policies to make sure we're getting the the right to have a housing choice and for me i think if there's opportunities particularly where you can show that there there is community community support to uh, to to allow some more more housing options i you know i think there's there are going to be as as we kind of talked about before the ocp is going to be a living document and we are going to, to see some changes but to me i don't think they're not going to be just things slipped in they, they do need that 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 public engagement process i also think as we start to see more of these housing choices whether they be laneway housing or townhouse in the community some of the the fear and, and misconceptions about other forms of housing will start to dissipate and things, you know, I remember when I first got on council in 2005 uh, and the topic of laneway housing came up <laughs> and it was, it was going to destroy the city <laughs> and it would be the worst thing that, that would ever happen to, to, to the community and we didn't go ahead with it at that time but over the past decade that conversation has changed in our community and what we found in yeah. the OCP process was that the vast majority of people supported that type Clamoring of housing option. for it well and, so, and they need it now because in 2005 a house was very attainable for young professionals now a house in new west is out of reach even for people making uh even for professionals with two incomes it, it can be really difficult we all live in townhouses we all live in townhouses yeah. well and it's sad like last week i had a client who only wanted to look in new west we looked at all the townhouses available and they bought in burnaby and and they were dead set the only place i'm going to buy is new west but it, it just didn't exist yeah. for them which sucks um, I, I do want to add just one more bit to the the development mm -hmm. part of OCP. So, so Jonathan, you're talking about how the OCP can be sort of uh, not revised, but if people want to make changes and bring them to council. You're open and open to listening. Uh, from my perspective, representing somebody who wants to buy a piece of land and think of its future potential, what we all know is that no promises can be made. 
right? So they're, they're buying it on the, the OCP, the idea behind it, the way that we look at it as realtors is it's a guideline to say you're very likely to get approval for something that fits within the OCP. If it's outside of that, you're taking a big risk. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I'd always caution people taking on, on that risk. You know, mm-hmm. if you're buying a property that's not designated the OCP as high rise, you're taking a pretty big gamble if you're going down down that that process there, and and likewise, uh, you know, with the townhouse designation, I generally would, you know, you know, people that are interested in kind of putting these things is say focus on the properties. You know, <laughs> if you want to build townhouses, well, there are you know a, a vast number of properties that have been designated. That's where your attention should be as those areas potentially evolve evolve there because, you know, I think the worst scenario you have, and, and this is one of my frustrations uh, that we often get from developers, is when, when they go down this process and they complain, well, we paid all this money for this property and now we can't do it. I'm like, well, if you'd actually read the planning documents, you would have known that this was actually not something that's, uh, you know, that's supported by the community plan. And to me, I think the, the Fisher community plan and the land use designations uh, are the most important starting point because that's the, the first guide and lens that I look at in terms of any decision that I, I make around the table is, is this consistent with the Fisher community plan? And if it's not, it, it better have some pretty strong rationale and pretty strong benefits to the community for, for me to be looking to, uh, to make changes. So on that note of developers... When we put out the call for questions, one thing that came up over and over again was frustrations with promises by developers. Now we're talking condos now uh, that were not delivered on. And the the two points that were brought up multiple times uh, were uh, in Victoria Hill, uh, both uh, parking promises as well as uh, bringing local businesses in. And then there was a lot of talk uh, over in Queensboro. Uh, there were the developer uh, Aragon over there was was promising a pedestrian bridge, which never happened. And I, I walked into that sales center, and they they one hundred percent were saying it is approved. It's a done deal. Here we go. What if anything can council and do to hold developers accountable, or is that outside of your scope? Yeah, well, and uh, you know, maybe I shouldn't do this, but I, I might actually even turn the table on on you guys. I'm, I'm dealing okay. with some folks in in yeah. the real estate industry, and what we often find in sales center or even just general realtors, and yeah. is you know definitely in that sales environment, the pitch often doesn't quite match match the reality, and it's a frustration for for myself often having to deal with with residents who have who have been over promised, oversold on something that. You know, there mm-hmm. were some very key details that uh, that were missed out. Uh, uh, and, you know, I've heard from from residents who said, well, you know, we were told that the, the whistles don't blow at night. And I'm like, well, no, that's, that's, <laughs> that's not the case. And, and certainly development sales centers, uh, you know, you, you often go into them and they're filled with, you know, young, energetic sales staff there yeah. um, and who wouldn't necessarily know a full knowledge and, and of, of things. And, uh, you know, it's 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 difficult. Uh, but. You know, I, I often look to how can how can the sales side of things, how can the real estate side of things actually do a better better job, and is there a way to actually work with the city to to do to better education? I've always taken any opportunity, whether it's uh, you know being invited to, uh, to to real estate offices, uh, to be able to help inform what's happening yeah. in the city and provide provide accurate information. And I think that's the, that's the city's role, but I think there's also an onus on on you know people selling real estate to uh, you know to to really bring some integrity and and make sure yeah. what they're saying isn't just about trying to get the sale, but actually genuinely representing the the community and the neighborhood uh, that that people are moving into. Well, and if we go on a tangent for just a second, right now there's a real shift in the real estate community uh, since the Globe and Mail did their gigantic expose on some of the seedier practices happening, and there has been a real crackdown. Um, I think what you're saying is hire local realtors who know what they're talking about, <laughs> if I'm going to paraphrase. Um, but um, Well, my blood uh, is boiling right now because we get incredibly frustrated by people coming in and, and, and falsely advertising what the community is and how it functions. And yes. It's, it's, it's incredibly frustrating to our industry, to our profession, and our integrity. So we get a little bit stuck because it makes us look bad as well, um, which I, I know you understand. I mean, these developers aren't making probably anybody looking bad promising a pedestrian bridge that wasn't there. Um, as a, as a direct black and white question, if you walked into that sales center, just you personally and, and witness that, could you say 
that is simply not true. Take that down now. Because I can't say that. They, they, they just kick me out and say, your clients can't buy here anymore. One, one of the problems, <laughs> too, is the sales centers don't always operate under the same MLS rules as us. Okay, the, 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 the people selling in a sales center may or may not actually be a licensed realtor. And so they, like, we have very strict guidelines about if we do something fraudulent, there is a process for somebody making a complaint. The sales center, it's, it's not necessarily the same rules that we operate under. Yeah. So I, you know, I definitely think if, if the city were, is made aware of uh, particular claims that are being made, uh, you know, those conversations can, can happen. Unfortunately, though, the city's never going to be privy to the thousands of different conversations that might happen, happen in a sales center. So it's, sure. it's a challenge. Uh, um, but, you know, I think there's, there's opportunities and, you know, maybe the city can play a, a more of a role to, to actually make sure we're getting the right information out. But I think the onus is still going to be on, on the sales community to, uh, you know, to have a level of standards. And, you know, that's, it's interesting, you know, the point you make about having different uh, accreditation and uh, rules based on development sales center compared to, to regular real estate agents. Because really, if you're in a sales center, you're a real estate agent and, and should abide, be abiding by the Yeah, same. I mean, as far as the public is concerned, I don't think anybody walks in and realizes, oh, there's a different set. I mean, a lot of their stuff isn't on MLS either, so it never gets seen. By, by the back to our listeners, please go back to episode 17 with our pre-sales insider. With our Courtney pre-sales Edwards. insider, yeah. <laughs> uh, we do talk about a lot of this stuff and the benefits of, of having somebody on your side. And so if you're hearing this and it's getting your blood boiling, it's a good listen. Yeah. Okay, that's enough of a tangent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so affordability seems to be the constant talking point. And we've talked a little bit about row housing and, and townhouses and OCP. Um, which I always want to say, you know me afterwards. Um, <laughs> what else can city council do as far as uh, strategies? How much of an impact can you have? Because the the affordability crisis is a lot bigger than just New West. No, no doubt, and you know, I'd say affordability is probably the biggest issue, yeah. not only in New Westminster <laughs> but all across across Metro Metro Vancouver. So, you know, I think it's important to recognize that cities do have a role to play and do have jurisdictions where they can have have an influence. But there are a lot of areas uh, that are outside of uh, of the jurisdiction of, of of local governments, and really, it's about how how do the different governments be able to to kind of do everything in their powers to to be able to look at that. Uh, you know, I think. Sometimes when we talk about affordable housing, though, uh, mm-hmm. you know, everyone nods their head and goes, yeah, that is that is a big issue. But yeah. then when you realize everyone actually, it's a big issue for a different reason for a lot of different folks. Uh, oh, interesting. You know, the housing spectrum is, is pretty significant. Uh, you know, yeah. it goes all the way down through, you know, dealing with the issue of homelessness and social housing all the way up to, you know, market market housing for single-family homes. Protecting someone's $2 million investment, it, which to them is just as important as exactly. somebody and, without a uh, home. So, you know, I think you... And, and oftentimes, you know, I get a bit frustrated because I'll be talking about a, a particular segment or policy we're working on, and people will be frustrated because I'm not talking about their segment. <laughs> uh, but I think from a, a policymaker's point of view... Hmm. An effective affordable housing strategy and policies actually are ones that, that, that meet all of those, those different areas. So, you know, I think starting on one end of the spectrum, uh, you know, New Westminster has, you know, a really good track record uh, of, of being able to support and have partnerships with, with social housing in, in, the, in the community. Uh, our city, you know, used to have some pretty significant homelessness issues in our community. And, yep. and that was really actually causing a lot of challenges in, in our downtown neighborhood. Uh, over the past 10 years, uh, we've seen almost, you know, over 200 new social housing units being built in that, that neighborhood. And what it's done is it's actually allowed folks that were living on the street, they're still in New Westminster, but they're in proper housing, you know, if they're dealing with addiction issues, if they're dealing with mental health issues, those issues are better addressed when, when people have housing. And we found a lot of the disturbances and we've got a lot of reports on our police, you know, our police activities have gone significantly down since we've been able to, to support that housing. Moving along the spectrum, though, uh, you move into to kind of non-market, uh, you know, affordable affordable housing. You know, many people are just not able to, to get there. So this is things like supporting things like the Metro Vancouver Housing Corporation or co-op housing, those types of housing forms that, that you still pay pay rent, but it's below what the, what the regular market. You need to be able to find ways. Uh, often those types of housing does require partnerships with upper levels of government to, to mm-hmm. really support and make happen. Uh, moving along the spectrum, though, he's moving just on to, to market rental. And I think New Westminster has actually led uh, the Metro Vancouver region with our, with our rental housing policy. Uh, number one, we do, we do have policies in place that uh, really have discouraged the redevelopment of the, uh, of the older rental, rental stocks. So in other communities, uh, you know, in, in Metro Vancouver, a lot of the, you know, 
30, 40 year old rental buildings have been torn down for, for redevelopment. And what that's led to is a lot of displacement uh, of right. people. If you, if you really think about it, uh, that, that form of uh, housing in New Westminster is, is actually, even though it's not subsidized, is actually one of the most important forms of affordable housing that we have in our community. Mm. And the folks that live in a lot of those buildings would not be able to find homes in our community if that housing option wasn't there. So really proud of the policies we put in place. Uh, we haven't had a single demolition of a rental building in the last uh, last five years really? since we put the, the policies huh. in place. And, you know, if you're riding along the SkyTrain, you can see that that's not <laughs> been the case in, in, in other communities. Uh, we've also recognized that for about 20 or 30 years, uh, rental housing was not built in, uh, in in New Westminster or or Metro Vancouver to any great uh, great extent, and uh, the city of New Westminster actually started putting towards some incentives to kind of help balance the you know the economic equation between building a condo and uh, and a rental unit. And we've actually seen a thousand new rental units uh, either completed or are currently under under construction right now in the city. And that's pretty significant given that for probably about 20 to 30 years, there wasn't, you know, you'd be mm-hmm. lucky if you had 200 units built in, in that period, uh, period of time. So it's not only about protecting the existing stock, it's actually making sure some of the new stock actually has, has that there. And then getting into the other end of the spectrum, to me, it's all about making sure we're providing as many housing options as, as possible. So it gets back to the Fisher Community Plan saying, where can we allow for, for new units to be able to, uh, to, to come on stream? New housing options like townhouses, laneway housing there. Uh, we were the first city in, in Canada to implement uh, you know, the family-friendly housing policy saying that uh, a certain percentage of new uh, condo buildings actually have to be three-bedroom units. And really the thinking behind that policy is we need to provide more housing options. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, it was was not really that common that uh, families would be living in more urban environments. Uh, right. But for cost pressures or even just lifestyle choices, uh, you know, you only have to go to Kakite Elementary School and just see the uh, incredible attendance numbers uh, that uh, that are at that elementary school in downtown New West to, to realize a lot more families are, are making those types of choices, choices there. And you need to make sure that as new developments come in, they can actually accommodate the demographics uh, that, that are coming into place there. Okay, so uh, speaking now to uh, single-family lots, uh, this is a question that we ended up getting into maybe in a little too much detail with your incumbent uh, teammates there. But uh, what I was asking about was, uh, personally, my personal opinion is I'm not a huge fan of laneway housing. I, I feel like it just consumes the lot. We lose green space, and, and I grew up with a big yard as a kid, and I, I want people to have that dream if they buy a single-family lot, and I want that retained in town. But what I find is the floor space ratio uh, outside of the west end of New West at 50% of lot size, uh, typically most people just build that 50% of their lot uh, above ground. So uh, there's no basement. And that house that then stands there and exists, to me, is a tasteful piece of architecture for the land. I think it fits the size of the land well. It doesn't seem to be an issue for me. Um, I would rather see a basement under that house than a laneway house in behind. So my question to you as a resident and a voter in your next term, is that something that you would look at as an idea to to implement or consider or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, you know, I, I definitely think basements, whether they include basement suites or just basements are actually a good use of, of, mm-hmm. of space uh, there. So, you know, I think any policies that might help kind of jig the single family zoning to, to encourage that. Uh, you know, New Westminster has a long history, one of the longest histories of uh, either grandfathering in illegal basement suites or actually permitting basement suites uh, right. in, in the region. And, you know, I think that was our, our big debate with even laneway housing is, is it one or the other, like it is in many communities? And we said, no, actually, these are both, both important, uh, important forms of mm. forms of housing there. But, uh, you know, I think it's a, a good point. If there's, you know, some, some things in our, our zoning bylaw that, uh, you know, might be having some unintended consequences, uh, you know, and, and preventing, say, basement suites from, from being building, uh, you know, I think that needs to be on the table. I just don't like seeing a house sitting there with no basement underneath it if the house itself fits the lot. I just feel like it, there's, there's a lot of wasted opportunity. But that's how the bylaws are written, right? The only alternative would then to be, you know, you build your 50% ratio, but you put 15% below ground. I'd rather just see 50 above ground, or let's say 40 above ground, and then add 15 or 20 below, something to that effect, right? So anyway, that's my own little personal uh, platform for today. So the Queen's Park Heritage Conservation Area was a bit of a contentious issue when it first came uh, came out and, and its implementation. Um, looking back, do you, would you say it was successful? Is there anything you would do differently if you had a do-over? 
Yeah. So you know, I've uh, I, I I support the the conservation area that uh, that that has been built. I think Queens Park is is one of the most unique neighborhoods actually in in, in Canada when it comes to to heritage. And uh, this is this is a tool that's used effectively in other other communities that local governments have to to uh, uh, when you have these kind of historical historical mm-hmm. neighborhoods to preserve that. Um, if I were to change things differently, though, um, one thing I would do is we this year implemented a lot of incentives to add to the heritage conservation area. And in retrospect, that should have actually come in at the exact same time as the heritage conservation area, because I think we put one in in place and then spent a year working on, on the incentives that would be, would be a part of that. And looking back at that, I think the conversation actually would have been a lot more balanced and, 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 Probably would have gotten more more acceptance with, uh, with with some of the individuals that were concerned about it if we'd done those processes at uh, at, at the same time. So that was that was my big learning and, and takeaway mm. from that is that those processes were separated and and really should have been done in tandem. What's an example of? of those incentives. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's different incentives. Uh, you know, if your, your house is part of the heritage conservation area, there's a flexibility in terms of what you can do with, with laneway housing. Um, there's, uh, uh, mm. you know, floor space ratio, you've got uh, opportunities to actually have larger floor space ratio, you know, whether it's an addition to, to a house, uh, mm. there that you wouldn't otherwise have in, 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 in other single family, family neighborhoods. So, you know, there's, there's a number of incentives that I think really do add a lot of value, value to that and help kind Kind of you know in some way re- reward uh, you know residents that uh, uh, that that are are dealing with a heritage house which does have extra costs in, in terms of maintaining and, and preserving as well do you see the conservation area ever expanding you know i I probably would say no. Uh, you know, I think there is wonderful heritage in, in other neighborhoods in the community, and I think there's other policy tools like heritage revitalization agreements that the city uh, has has entered in on case by case basis outside the neighborhood, which in, in many ways does does replicate that. Um, but I don't think uh, you know some of the other neighborhoods in, in New Westminster have the the same high density of, of heritage assets into it, and I think that's critical if you're going to go to this level of, of policy. Uh, it really does need to to have that a, a very high level there, and and I don't you know other neighborhoods do have wonderful wonderful heritage, and I think the city does need to to be looking at that and finding ways to encourage that. But I don't think you know Queens Park uh, you know is a little bit more unique when it comes to the density of of, of heritage uh, assets in there. The next core topic we want to speak to is, is infrastructure, and that's related to housing development. And it, it does relate in two categories because, of course, we have the single-family segment, and there's a lot of uh, sewer infrastructure work that goes on that as people see our streets torn up through the summer. And uh, and then all of we're adding a lot of density in uptown or a lot of density in downtown, and, and a lot of our listeners have had questions around that. So let's first talk about uh, condo development. We're adding a lot of density. Uh, let's talk about uh, on the key. So there's been two developments that have been approved right on the waterfront. There's a lot of concern about uh, infrastructure in a lot of ways, but the most common thing we hear about is traffic, just moving the vehicles in and out of the key. Uh, you can speak to that specifically or any other sort of plans and thoughts that are going around to help educate us and the uh, the listeners about how the city plans for this. Yeah, well, you know, definitely in that context, uh, you know, downtown New Westminster for, for decades has been the area designated to to be a high growth and high density density neighborhood. And I actually think the, the transformation that we've seen in downtown New Westminster, the biggest reason that neighborhood has turned around is there are now thousands of people that live in downtown New Westminster that weren't living there there before. Uh, you know, so I think if, if there had been no development there, there would be no turnaround uh, in, in, in downtown New Westminster. Uh, but I think it's also, in, and I think a lot of people aren't aware of this, is a lot of what they see in terms of new developments uh, are, are pre-existing zoning. Uh, you know, our waterfront was actually originally zoned for 13 high-rises, which uh, I, I fully support, uh, you know, high density in, in downtown New Westminster, but I've, I've actually always had issues with uh, the fact that our entire waterfront uh, uh, there had been zoned for that. And mm-hmm. I think probably one of the, the best decisions and decisions I'm most proud of to, to have been involved with uh, at the city was, was actually purchasing uh, the, the property where the Westminster Pier Park lies. Uh, that was a unique opportunity when in 2008, after the uh, the financial crisis, uh, the owner of that property went into receivership, and the city had a unique opportunity to buy a piece of property that was zoned for eight high-rise towers, 
and actually come up with it with a different vision, which is which is now Westminster Westminster Pier uh, Pier Park. Um, hmm. So you know, no doubt, uh, you know, we do have have a lot of growth in the area, but uh, you know, I you know what I often say is. Uh, the best places to to be encouraging growth in Metro Vancouver is in areas served with multiple transportation options. So areas near SkyTrain stations, areas near other other uh, transit transit options. Because if people aren't living in those locations and they're being pushed out farther and farther or into different areas into more car dependent communities, that actually has more of a detrimental impact. Uh, you know, I think. In New Westminster, there's no doubt we've got uh, we've got congestion challenges that that we face in uh, in our city. But the vast majority of vehicles that we see during rush hour aren't starting or stopping their trip in uh, in, in New Westminster. So I think sometimes looking at, at at some of the you know the high density developments around the New Westminster SkyTrain station and connecting that with the traffic issues, I think is is actually not not overly accurate because uh, downtown New Westminster actually has some of the lowest car ownership rates in all of Metro Vancouver and some of the highest public transit uses. And that's exactly the type of behavior that you can, you can start to, to shift with good, good land use planning. And that's, uh, that's a lot of the thinking that, uh, that has been gone in there. Uh, no doubt, uh, with a growing community, we're going to have to be working, and, and significant improvements in, in how the traffic flows are going to be connected with those developments are part of it. Uh, every new uh, building that comes into, into the city, uh, a lot of traffic studies and traffic enhancements and traffic flow is, uh, is, 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 is definitely incorporated there. Uh, you'll often see new lights, new, uh, you know, do uh, uh, you know new areas for, for pedestrians once uh, often paid by new development when when those do come in so on that note of having so many people transiting, one thing I noticed probably about five years ago when we had a lot of people moving into New West New West originally, like when I was a kid, New West was known as uh, lots of kids and lots of seniors, and there's definitely been. A lot of people who've kind of, for financial reasons, been pushed out of Vancouver and possibly Burnaby and have chosen New West and are commuting downtown for work. What sort of strategies has the city done to try and bring those people into the community? Yeah, well, you know, I think uh, New Westminster actually probably about 10 years ago had to actually face a question. Do do we want to become a bedroom community or yeah. do do we actually want to be a city where people live, work and work and play? And, uh, you know, the decision we take is, no, there's there's actually a strong advantage for our community to, to be places where, where all three of those things are, are accommodated. So, uh, you know, we've done a lot with our, our economic strategy to to recognize that some of the traditional old industries that, that were the major employers in our city um, are leaving our city and leaving the metro vancouver urban urban region for a variety of regions but how do we actually shift ourselves and, and make sure that we're bringing in new new employment there? And uh, our main focus has been been in two areas. Number one is is related to, to healthcare. Uh, the Royal Columbian Hospital is one of the largest hospitals in British Columbia, and there is a significant economic jobs and uh, a spinoff that comes from from that hospital. And how can we do a better job of actually encouraging the development of of new employment opportunities around around the hospital? Because there's lots of businesses that, for a variety of reasons, like to be located close to a major major hospital. So, uh, you know, I think that's going to lead to some significant opportunities in, in the Sapperton, Sapperton area. Uh, the other thing we're finding is, is a huge opportunity is is with, uh, you know, more high-tech uh, and knowledge-based uh, mm. based companies. Uh, we're finding that uh, a lot are being priced out of Vancouver and uh, in places like Gastown or Yaletown, but are finding that New Westminster has the transit access that employees are, are looking for, uh, but also has that kind of character and charm that you might find in, in, in an older city or an older part of the city like, uh, like Gastown. And, uh, you know, a lot of the new companies that are are now filling up some of the older buildings on on Columbia Street that have been vacant for for years are now filled with you know small fifty fifty person uh, uh, you know software software companies, and we're starting to see that New Westminster is is well positioned. So uh, we've done a lot of work with our, our our fiber network bridge network to to help kind of encourage that type of business to to want to, to want to locate there. And you know, to me, I think that's a big part. If you can also be a community that uh, that has jobs, uh, that's going to attract. A, a whole new level level of activity and you know the final component you know you say live work and the final one is play and yeah. uh you know new westminster has made some significant investments uh you know things like uh westminster pier park you know in my opinion have, have really transformed the city and provided an amenity uh, that is really attractive and is an attractive selling feature for the community uh the anvil center is uh, is also another incredibly arts focused facility that really is now a, a, re- 
regional draw and, and, you know, a place that I think New Westminster can proudly welcome in our residents and people from across the region uh, into to a variety of different activities. I will mention with that, we do our regional REMAX meetings almost always are held at the Anvil Centre. Yeah, now. REMAX holds their, it's great. We just walk down the street. <laughs> <laughs> but people are coming from, from everywhere in Metro Vancouver. that they, they, they find it's a good central hub, right? So... To exactly to that point. Uh, a couple of things you mentioned that are really good to expand on. Uh, so you mentioned Anvil Center, uh, Pier Park. Uh, we've had some questions and comments around that. Uh, you and I have spoken about this personally in the past. It's difficult to host some of the events that maybe it seems it has the potential for because of, uh, let's just say, fire safety, crowd size management. Um, with the new staircase that's been sort of finalized at 4th, uh, what are the capacities now, or do you have future plans for that in your next term if you are reelected? Yeah, well, you know, I think what you're, you're getting to is is kind of events that the city can can host and uh you know i think uh, we've, we've come a, come a long way in the past decade to to in my opinion become a, a really fun fun city and i i think we need to find ways to to make it easier for community groups uh, organizations to to actually put on events festivals in in our community because you know this past summer there was hardly a weekend went by without some major event happening happening in our community and there was a really good vibe vibe going on uh through through there um but the reality is Cities don't put on festivals. Cities don't operate festivals. Uh, cities, uh, you know, can provide what I often say is the canvas, but it's a community that actually has to, uh, you know, has to turn things into into yeah. a masterpiece. Um, but you know, sometimes there's a question of how can the city better support, uh, and how can we get out of the way when that's possible? And it's, mm. you know, in my role, sometimes it's difficult when I get well, the fire chief is saying X regulation needs to be put in place. And that's actually causing causing an issue for a festival because you you got to take that kind of advice seriously. But you know, I think if the city generally wants to be a fun city, a city that uh, that is constantly having having events going on, we need to be having those dialogues, saying how how are we helping facilitate that, support that, and get out of the way when we need to. Yeah. Does the city need to invest in more infrastructure for Pier Park to allow those large size events that I think a lot of people are ambitious to see? I, I feel like we should just give you a little bit of context. We had somebody else come on the show. Jer, what we had somebody else say that there was a, a it was structural a limit on Pier Park. Is there truth to that as far as how many people can physically be supported? So I, I, where I think that's probably coming from is there's two parts of, of Pier Park. There's the, the part that's been, been rebuilt, and then there's a, a portion where the, the volleyball courts and, and the W are located on that are, are actually on the original original pier. Um, definitely the, the access uh, to, to that location is a bit more challenging and, and does require a bit more work. It, it also, there are potentially more limits on, on that piece of infrastructure, given that it is older infrastructure. But, you know, a case in point, we, you know, we hosted the Safe and Sound Music Festival uh, this, this past August, uh, you know, which had thousands of people come, be able to come, come down there for, right. for music festivals. So the venue can, can work, but there are some aspects that obviously do need to be worked through. So a couple thousand, I wasn't, I didn't attend that, that festival, but so a couple thousand. Because you don't do drugs. Is that what it's for? I, I, <laughs> I'm joking. Safe and Sound was like an electronic music festival. Oh, okay. It's one of those. Um, so a couple thousand people is, is fine sort of on that, uh, that sort of venue. Yeah, and you know, this past summer, I don't know if uh, you guys had a chance to, to get down to Music by the River, but this actually ended up being one of my favorite events to bring my family to the year because, uh, you know, there was probably, I'd say, three three to five hundred people each uh, each Thursday uh, in, in July and, and August at, at there um, you know you can get steal an old beer get some uh, get, get Pacific Breeze wine at, at the concession stand and it was a good place just to bring the kids because you could just let them let them loose and uh, enjoy that and to me you know I think that's when when we're envisioning building Westminster Pier Park right. you know that event really in, in my opinion epitomizes what we what we wanted to see happening in that space I remember that when we first saw the Uptown Live Festival happen um, I, I and maybe you guys agree with me, but I, I was always of the mind that this is a great festival should have been downtown. Well, you know, I I actually think New Westminster is really fortunate to to have a lot of commercial traditional main street districts. And, mm. you know, I think there's there's value in, you know, no doubt our downtown is is our hub and our core and is a very successful location. But, uh, you know, whether it's an uptown or, you know, Saffron and Days, which is one of the longest standing festivals going on in the city, uh, you know, I think the, it's these types of events that, that kind of bring life and vibrancy to our different commercial main streets. And, I you know, I think there is value in, uh, in showcasing the, the different uh, commercial areas that we have in our city. Mm. 
So the, the core topic we were discussing here was infrastructure. And uh, it, it's amazing, actually, through our experiences in town, there's a lot we can talk to about it, but we do need to move on. Uh, but in doing that, uh, as you campaign for your re-election, is there anything else that you want our listeners to hear that is a priority for you in infrastructure in the city? Yeah, well, you know, I think probably the the, the two biggest uh, community amenities uh, when it comes to, to infrastructure is, number one, the, the redevelopment of, of the Canada Games Pool. Uh, you know, that's the most well-used uh, facility that we have, have in our community, um, but it's starting to reach the end of its life, and I think it's you know now that it's a big project but now that needs to be a, a real focus uh what's being contemplated to be to be built there is actually 65 percent larger than the community center and the pool that currently exists there and i think is, is going to be designed to to really serve the community in the future uh, but we need to move beyond the consultation and the planning and, and actually get down to to building that uh and the next uh community amenity project uh uh, that uh, you know really is is important to me is is actually connecting our our riverfront. Uh, you know I think New Westminster has some really really special places on our riverfront like Westminster Pier Park, the Quayside Boardwalk, Sapperton and Landing, uh, in in Queensboro. But unfortunately, it's it's not all connected. And you know I often compare it to you know can you imagine the the Stanley Park uh, walkway? If there were, you know, two or three sections where you just you had to stop and you couldn't stop couldn't and continue. turn around on the seawall, yeah. <laughs> it, it wouldn't be the same same place. So, you know, uh, something that I'm really eager to to continue to to push forward is actually connecting Sapperton Landing Park to Westminster Pier Park because I think if you're able to do that, that's an important big gap that would, you know, all of a sudden connect our city almost from one end to to the other along our riverfront. So that's something you really want to sort of pioneer and advocate for in the next term. Definitely. Okay. Cool. So moving on from infrastructure now, uh, Jeff, do you want to introduce uh, some of the, the core topics we want to speak to for renters? We did It did come up quite a bit as we were talking about the different uh, levels of housing, but we have a couple extra points. The only thing I just want to ask you, Matt, is I know you wanted to ask about the patella. Oh, yeah. I mean, we could add that in. Um, as, a, as a quick side note, um, I'm informed enough to know that the reason why a four-lane bridge was approved for the Patello Bridge replacement is that the city of New West simply doesn't have the road network to handle the traffic that would come from a six-lane bridge. Is that correct? Yeah, that was the, the city of New Westminster's main point is building, spending another $500 million building a larger bridge to have traffic not be able to move in the city was not, not a good use, a good use of, uh, of investment there. I really cool. wanted them to tell you you were wrong again. <laughs> <laughs> just, just say it anyway. I shouldn't, I shouldn't end questions with am I right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. Okay, so follow-up question being, and this this might be, who knows, 10, 25 years down the road, but at what point, what do we need to see for road network uh, improvements in New West to allow for that six-lane expansion? Yeah, so the the new bridge is, is being built so that it can be can be expanded to, to six, um, but there'll definitely have to be a regional discussion about whether that's that's needed in the, in the future or not. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of trends. 20 years, transportation may look a lot different than it is right now. You know, we, we don't know how autonomous vehicles are going to to change vehicle we don't know a lot of different trends my uh, car will fly right over the bridge but, <laughs> you know that's probably not going to happen but uh, <laughs> but things could be very different uh you know 20 years from now than than they are right now but you know i think some of the things if, if we were to kind of look at today's scenario the type of investments that that we'd be looking at uh is looking at where where things bottleneck and i you know i think royal avenue is is definitely would be in every concern yeah. i think the idea of you know if you're going to expand the bridge capacity you know maybe there are, you know, is a tunnel option where the regional traffic can actually tunnel under and you could actually turn Royal back into into a local road. So that would be an idea that could be looking at on, on how you could actually have that accommodation. The other one is, you know, if you think about a lot of the traffic is just trying to get to uh, get to Highway 1, but it all gets because of land gets actually narrowed into 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 a pretty tight uh, tight gap and uh you know i think the city has always been open and this would require some significant investment in property acquisition that that would be on the means of of, of the city of new westminster but could you create another another lane on brunette to help get that traffic mm. to uh, uh to to the highway one quarter where a lot of traffic's going so it's those types of projects where the city would be putting on the table saying you know what if we are going to have that conversation about increasing the capacity we've got to be able to make it so that it actually works and we actually got to be able to mitigate some of the the neighborhood impacts uh, you know the city of new westminster already has hundreds of thousands of vehicles traveling through our city uh each day not starting or stopping their their trip here um you know you got to be able to you can design it so that's mitigated mm-hmm. and can be a part but if it's just 
creating more neighborhood issues and that traffic is just ultimately funding through local roads and making it more and more difficult for uh, you know residents to be able to get through their own city in the day uh, you're not necessarily solving solving problems there so I think you know careful look and you know what step one is is actually getting the the Patel bridge uh, replaced and that's been that's been a long-standing uh, issue, yeah. finally getting funding. So I think that was uh, an important to move forward because the existing bridge, uh, you know, it's on it's on borrowed time. And I was worried we'd get to the point where we'd actually have to shut the existing bridge before a new bridge is built. Right. And, and that wouldn't have benefited anyone uh, in the city or the region. Right. So let's talk to housing for renters. And as Matt said, we already went over a little bit of this, but we probably still have a couple questions for you. Um one question that did come up uh, was what what can council do uh, to help people who are being uh, or facing rent eviction? And if any of our listeners don't know what a rent eviction is, um, landlords are one of the ways they can legally evict a tenant is if they're doing a renovation. How much renovation is uh, sometimes suspect because I believe it's supposed to be like an actual full-blown renovation, not just painting the walls. Um, but it seems that more and more people are facing rent evictions. Is there anything that can be done to help renters with that? Yeah. Well, this is this has probably been the most difficult issue that I've I've faced in in my my first term term as mayor because there's there's nothing more painful than than dealing with a resident, a long term resident in in the city mm-hmm. who is being evicted from from their apartment under under this situation. And is, doesn't have the financial means to be able to find new housing options in in the community. And there's nothing more painful for for someone right. like myself in in that role. Uh, you know, the city has has really struggled because in the past, uh, you know, renovations aren't a brand new issue, but they would happen maybe one every two or three years. We would get a situation where right. a building needed to to see some some maintenance uh, and and significant investments in it, and it did uh, did result in in in, uh, in evictions. But uh, what we've seen with the you know, changing real estate market though is unfortunately we're getting a lot more yeah. pressure and a lot more, you know, landlord building owners actually going down this route. And you know, I, I think some of it is motivated by the fact that if you're able to evict a long term tenant and then charge market rent, there's a lot more revenue revenue opportunities. Uh, the challenge we've had in the city is, uh, you know, rent evictions are something that's governed by the Residential Tenancy Act, which is actually a provincial a provincial responsibility. So, you know, we've we've taken a lot of a lot of heat about about the evictions, but there's actually legally no mechanism for the city to to actually stop them from from happening, given as long as they're following the rules laid out in the in the Residential Residential Tenancy Act. Uh, two years ago, the city of New Westminster put forward a motion to uh, to the UBCM, and this is a, a conference of all the municipalities in British Columbia and got it successfully passed, basically urging the provincial government to make changes to the Residential Tenancy Act to better protect existing existing rentals renters in the building. Uh, you know, I think moving forward, uh, you know, we need to continue to advocate and, and have this discussion. You know, either the provincial government makes some changes to the Residential Tenancy Act to, you know, make it a little bit harder for, for landlords uh, to be able to, to kind of have that onus of proof in terms of the maintenance that is mm-hmm. being done on, on the buildings and that it's not superficial changes and it's motivated for the right reasons or give cities the tools to to be able to to kind of enter enter that conversation uh i actually think you you kind of need a, a carrot and stick approach uh, uh you know I, could, I think in one aspect uh, you know you can't just demonize all, all landlords uh there they're they're running a business they're providing housing and in many cases a lot of these rental buildings are older buildings that do do need upgrades um and to me i actually think there there might be some opportunities to actually provide incentives to landlords who actually can do major renovations and upgrades to buildings without evicting tenants. So whether that's something like a, a tax deferral program like we do, you know, the provincial government has in place uh, for, for seniors in the community, maybe there's something, a similar policy that, that might actually provide that, that incentive to get landlords to think, you know what? Maybe there is a is a positive benefit for for me doing this without causing the the community disruption. And uh, you know, the other aspect is is there that more of a stick approach when when we're dealing with situations uh, where it's it's very clear the the maintenance and and work being done in the building is is cosmetic and is simply being done to to be able to to jack up the rents. Because I think those are the situations that that I'd like to see stopped. Is there anything else as far as housing affordability that you wanted to speak to? for renters that we didn't cover? Well, I, you know, I think we had a, a pretty broad con- yeah. conversation before, yeah. before yeah. about uh, rental housing. And, Definitely. You know, I think, you know, New Westminster, I, I'm actually really proud of, of the work we've done. Uh, you know, half of New Westminster's population are, are renters. And, uh, you know, I think it's it's sometimes a voice that's not, not heard too loudly in, in local government. But, 
you know, the policy work we've done on, on dem evictions, what we've done to actually encourage new rental, we're outpacing, you know, mm. any other municipality in, in, in Metro Vancouver. And I think Vancouver is probably the only city that's that's comparable to to some of the numbers that uh, that we're putting out on a per capita per capita basis. And uh, to me, I, I actually think the work we're doing, you know, the benefit to the region is actually if we can start to spread some of this policy work to some of the other municipalities in, in Metro Vancouver. So I, I think we're we're probably going to wrap up here. One question I wanted to ask you about really quick is if if you could go back in time to day one of your first term as mayor, what what advice would you give past past Jonathan Cote starting out on on the journey? Hmm. That's a that's that's an interesting question. Okay, <laughs> I've, I've I've got my time machine. I'm going back to uh, to inauguration day. Um, you know what? Uh, you know, I think it's 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 actually about uh, you know finding finding that balance. I think with with this role, um, it can take every minute of, of of your life, every every hour of, of your day. And you know, probably one of my biggest challenges is you know with a young family is is actually finding that balance, uh, being mm. able to be committed to to the role. But um, you know, sometimes you got to be able to to say no. And uh, I think I've gotten better at that over over the years. Uh, <laughs> and and my wife definitely appreciates uh, appreciates that. But uh, but it's a challenge because you you take on a new role like this, and you're very enthusiastic, and you want to you know to be at every event. You want to be supporting a lot of things, and and all of these things are are great. Um, but the reality is, no one individual can can really stretch themselves there and when you do that you often find you're not as effective in, in some of the other things mm. things you're doing there so right. uh, you know pacing myself a little bit a little bit more and uh, and and you know just being able to find that balance and occasionally you know recognizing you can't do everything awesome well thank you very much for coming on the show okay. um, if uh, is there where what's the best way for people to who want to dig deeper to to see your platform and and where should they go on the on the internets? Okay, well on on, on the internets, uh, send people to the website uh, vote uh, cote dot uh, dot ca. That's uh, vote cote. I, however you want to. <laughs> Matt know, has what, been waiting so long <laughs> to make that joke. <laughs> what, whatever gets gets people to the website works, works for me. But uh, you know during during this campaign, uh, we've actually been running a platform fifty ideas in fifty days. Uh, I believe we're on, on on Instagram. I've been on that. Instagram, Facebook, and and Twitter. So so all the social media platforms and, you know, it's, it's actually been a really great way to engage on a variety of topics. And, you know, to me, it was, was really important that, uh, you know, I'm proud of the record that, uh, that we've done and, and the work we've done here in the city of New Westminster. Um, but there are a lot of challenges that we face in our city and our region and, and just laying back and uh, running on a, on a record wasn't enough for me. To me, it was, I need to actually be putting forward new ideas and new direction on, on where we need to be moving for the city. And I've really enjoyed that policy. So if anyone on social media wants to follow the 50 ideas and 50 days campaign uh, uh when i get done this interview i'm going to head home and put the next idea up on, on on online great excellent well thank you guys very much for listening uh i'm jeff mclennan i've been here with matt brabens and jeremy ray matt is going to put everything in the show notes with time codes uh thank you once again okay thank, thank you. you thanks